curfew declared in Ota for as police and military take over the Kumasi suburb and after one person died and several others injured in a clash between Muslim youth and loyalists of the Tafo chief. Over 300 vehicles have reportedly been burned in the clash and the security personnel are overwhelmed by the situation. What triggered this violence in the Kumasi suburb between the two groups? What could be the dark consequences of this clash are the lives of many remaining danger? Who should be blamed for this confusion that seems to be claiming innocent lives? Also, policeman shoots two people to death as he mistook them for robbers. them for some time and the pillion rider that is the person who was sitting behind the uh, person who was riding uh turned so when uh he turned they mistook the turning to be that and he was holding something in his hands that was that appeared to them as a weapon so they thought he was turning to shoot them so they shot at them they pursued them for some time this raises questions about the professionalism of the police personnel. But whose duty is it to ensure best standards are here to? This is today's big story with me, Kwache Afrenyama. The non-Muslims are reportedly fighting off attempts by Muslims in the community to fence a cemetery in the area as they claim ownership of the place. It is unclear what triggered this violence. Let's uh, hear from one of the uh, factions in this entire brouhaha uh, belonging to the Muslim group. <laughs> Chief brought his people to destroy the fence wall. It was built by the Muslim community. He had issues with the fact that we built a fence wall on that land. He rained curses on the entire community because of that. He said whoever would bury a Muslim there would die. Then suddenly today he came here with his people. It is not true that this is a Muslim Christian fight. All we want is that they rebuild the fence wall for us. That is the only option we are giving them. This is simply unacceptable. Let's go for, over to Ota for now, the scene of this violence. Uh, uh, regional correspondent, in fact, a man with Love FM, Erastos Asare Donko, is there and brings us the latest from the area. Erastos, uh, we understand now that a curfew has been declared. Tell us more about that. Currently, the, a number of military personnel are enforcing the curfew. So uh, just behind me, we have a number of people who have been lined up and are being controlled by the military. They are asking everybody to move in line, go home, they say. Just don't loiter around. It's 6 o'clock. Don't let us see you on the street. That is what is happening. And it is being enforced strictly, I must say. Just in here, we can see uh, people who have been lined up, moving in a line, asking them to go home. Don't stay on the street. Don't cause any trouble. It tells you six to six, and it's been enforced strictly to the letter. We'll get more details about what really is happening on the ground, but give us a background of uh, what uh, led to all this. Well, this is a, um, a conflict that started about two months ago. It's about a piece of land at the Tafo Cemetery. Now, at the Tafo Cemetery, we have a place where Christians are buried. We have a place where Muslims and military men and other officers or, or uh, victims of war are buried. Now, the Muslim section is where the Muslims have started erecting a wall uh, to uh, cover. They claim there is encroachment, and so they want to contain the encroachment. And that is why they erected this wall. Now, the Tafu chief is claiming that where you have erected a wall at the now you have gone beyond your bounds. The land now does not belong to you. So 
you need to provide proof before you continue with the construction of the wall. That um, uh, provision was not adhered to. They continue constructing the wall until today that the chief ordered the demolition of part of the wall. And now this created the whole Buhaha. Now I learned the chief slapped somebody, a, Muslim, a member of the Muslim community at the graveyard, and he also replied. And so the chief brought in some reinforcement to deal with the situation. And the whole Muslim community in the Abu Abu Zongos, the, uh, all the Zongos joined in, and it resulted in this whole violent clash that has left one person dead, cause of people receiving machete wounds. You talked about one person uh, who's died already. Uh, Rastos, how did this happen? Well, I learned he was stabbed. And in fact, I have seen an autopsy report, a doctor's mini report uh, from the regional police command. I have seen it, uh, multiple stab wounds to the side, the abdomen, uh, which killed Amidi, Amidi Sulemana, uh, he's called. And so that is what killed him. It was a stab wound from some of the factions that resulted in his death. And we don't know which faction this person belongs? Do we know? No, we do not know because if you were to be on the street, you would see that it's uh, more like a, a theft war, uh, a conflict involving various groups. And so it is, not, it is very difficult to identify who stabbed this particular guy. In fact, several other people have received stab wounds as well. Uh, some have received stab wounds as well. And if you could hear in the background, it's, it's the enforcement of the curfew that is going on. Um, if you try to bypass what the arrangement that the military are giving, definitely uh, they will bring you to order. So if you hear in the background, that is actually what is happening now. The pictures we are seeing, the video, in fact, shows how chaotic the day has been. Give us a clear idea of uh, the, the sort of vandalism that's taking place there today. I can see some uh, vehicles that have been severely vandalized. Well, I must say that uh, there are reported cases. Several of those cases have happened uh, when you walk from the uh, Suame Magazine line uh, of the Tafo uh, Street right to Pansono, about three miles. Because of um, uh, vandalization, you can see traces of uh, vandalism across the street. Shops have been vandalized. Uh, you see a bank um, uh, that uh, have their... Uh, sidewalks or windscreens, uh, uh, various vehicles that had their windscreens smashed. And these are not vehicles that were used in uh, the conflict itself. These are parked vehicles. People who have left their shops had their shops vandalized. And these are people who were wielding, um, um, you know, offensive weapons. Swords, I must say, swords. In this age and era, we have swords. People are holding sharp swords. People are holding machetes, hammers. Um, a, a number of implements. And so it tells you the, the, the kind of, uh, the, the nature of the violence that went on on the street. People who are ready uh, and are ready for blood, ready to uh, do something to somebody. That was what happened. Total chaos. I, 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 I'm curious, Erastos, how quick was the response of the police when all this started? The police and the military? Well, that is what uh, some um, uh, residents, if you call it, uh, were not happy with because the police were here in their numbers, but then they were not taking any action as to uh, enforce the laws right there and then. Uh, uh, for, for some reasons, I do not know. Up to a point, before they started enforcing uh, this particular, uh, this whole uh, regulation towards them off. And I can understand in a certain angle because the, the crowds were indeed huge. If you, we are talking about thousands of people, youth, guarded, holding implements. So uh, perhaps um, it was to, not to create anything to further escalate uh, the violence. And I think it paid off because in the long run, uh, they were able to bring the place under control and currently the curfew is taking for. And, and have, any, have any arrests been made yet, Erastos? I was asking whether the, the police and military have money to make any arrests uh, yet. All right, it seems uh, we lost our man, Erastos Asare Donko, with Lava Firm in Kumasa, bringing us a comprehensive report on what is happening uh, there in uh, Old 
Tafo. Uh, we, we, we've been joined on the line by security analyst uh, Dr. Franklin Biney for some analysis on this. Uh, the week started on a bad note, several shootings and stabbings. Uh, Dr. Biney, your quick impressions about all this? Hello. Dr. Biney. Yeah, your voice is very faint. Can you lift up your voice a little bit? Dr. Biney, uh, I hope the line is better now. I am sitting at a place. I don't know. You are also sitting. It's unfortunate that the line, your line seems to be faint. Well, Go I, ahead. I hope you can, can hear me hear now. Me. What, what, I'm, what I'm asking, first and foremost, is your quick impressions on uh, what we see happening in uh, Tafo. Tafo, exactly. In fact, when you play the, the, the sound bite, actually, I could not get some. I got some. However, uh, if I got the little I can understand, then it means there is a conflict there where people seem to have been affected, if I'm right. Is that correct? Certainly. One person, we understand, has died. And I understand that, indeed, this thing took place in the palace. And then what really you know, led to that very conflict, I really don't seem to grasp it very well. Well, but the point is that... This... Mm. Go, ahead, go ahead, sir. Okay. So, uh, however, whatever led to the conflict that is taking place now, I think uh, what I, I know the policemen must be around them to look at the criminality out of it. However, we always have to remember that when conflict of such happens, especially at the traditional level or the coastal or the, 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 the local level, which is among the people, because they know themselves, this nuclear family, so they know one another. The most important thing the greatest for is the two parties themselves or the parties involved are supposed to be encouraged to come together to sit on a round table and to ensure that peace is prevailed. Whenever we come in or the police comes in, I know as plain policemen, you know, all is to ensure as the constitution and mandates them to ensure peace is prevailed. But unfortunately, sometimes when they go there, I am beginning to see that the young ones, the young policemen who have come into the, you know, the, 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 the force, are the ones who are with temperament. I don't know whether they always look at the temperament too. And at least moment, they put their hand on a trigger out of anger and a goal. But I know that in the police training, that before you can shoot, that is only extreme when you assess and analyze as a police officer, when you realize that you are in a very high danger. That is when, and but of recent, there's no much danger to the life of the, before, you know, he's gone with it. And that is, really, and at the end of the day, by the police law, the police must really check and really uh, pursue towards investigation. And at the end of the day, we don't hear anything. So I'm dealing with them to uh, look at the address. That will not be because village, community, a town like that, always the problem is what this conflict comes. It's the best is among themselves to sit and around it. When a third party, fourth party, comes in and they match it to, you know, law and also policy comes in, it worsens and escalates the whole thing to bring, uh, to avoid peace. Particularly listening to the two sides, you get a clear impression that they've taken an entrenched position on this, the Muslim community and the traditional uh, faction. How can this be tackled? Hello? Hello? Yeah, doc Hello? Doc Dr. Biney. Yes, please. Yes, yeah, so I was asking that looking at the posture of the two factions, how can the police security agencies ensure that the situation doesn't further escalate? They, they all seem to have taken an entrenched stance on this matter. Good. So they need to now, as they are on the ground now, they need to, you know, map out as they are in that very environment. They know. They should map. I'm just re-emphasizing and re-echoing of what they're supposed to do. They have been trained. They have to map out the area and then begin to identify the main source of the right information, where to tap. And then when you're able to, because sometimes when it comes, if you're not careful, the information that will come, most of them will be chaff. And when you receive chaff information, it will lead you to getting a very poor result as far as investigation or intelligence gathering are concerned. So they should not rush, but they should also be focused and be standing firm. When they have gathered this information from people that they believe they are the right source, then, of course, they will now, you know, you know analyze their what they are, and then draw the line between the words. Because this conflict, there are graduations and levels at which as well, we have not got to anywhere. It's just the beginning. And that, of course, this is the moment that the police can be able to, even though they have taken it, the, the community have taken an entrenched position, they should take it pipe down low and apply their principles of intelligence gathering. What at this stage is needed much intelligence. Because if you don't, 
the people who will really give you the actual and the true information, they will run away and it becomes very difficult to arrive. And that's why most cases, at the end of the day, you realize that they don't get to anywhere because the people to get the right information are absconded. But because they took so much haste in what, in, and also they depended upon the wrong informant. So this is the time they have to, and I will plead with the media also to exercise constraints and depend upon it so that they can follow them straight so that they will not report things. When the moment you in the airwaves goes, and if the person is the true person to give indeed the information that is required by the police, then of course, he will know what to do. So no matter the entrant position, the role and the honor lies on the police in an application of the intelligence gathering and application. We know now that a curfew is being enforced in the area. You think that is enough? Oh, there's a curfew now. The curfew comes in when I believe the curfew has come in because of the level at which they have seen all these sworn factors and the principles and the guides to ensure that there is peace. Because if they allow in the dark, in the dark hours, worse things can happen. So indeed, the police are applying their principles of war operation to ensure that peace. And they will take charge so that everybody must be indoors at this time so that unfortunate circumstances may not befall an individual or innocent people who don't, are it? not really involved in this. So I think the curfew will help and also enable the police to be able to um, uh, 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 work according to uh, the kind of uh, application of intelligence that they are gathering. Because some of them may go out and in the night they come in. So they will be on the ground day and night and they will be able to gather. But if they allow things to move by itself, as we are experiencing right now, oh, I can assure you that worse things will happen. The curfew always curtail, reduce, or de-escalate a lot of what is going on so that it controls escalation. Franklin Bainia, security analyst there, bringing his perspective on the situation at Tafo in the Ashanti region. We understand now, as you heard, that a curfew has been imposed in the area. Let's now talk about two men who have lost their lives because a policeman struggling to come to terms with a word professionalism saw no need to shoot uh, but to shoot and injure uh, persons he suspected to be armed robbers. This incident happened at the Mampon Midwifery School. ASP Mohamed Tanko, Ashanti Regional Police PRO, has been telling my colleague Francis Aban more about this. We extend the condolences of the regional command to the bereaved family. What happened was that uh, this morning at about uh, 2 a.m., there was a distress call that armed robbers had attacked a house uh, at the Mampo Midwifery Training School. So a patrol team was immediately dispatched to the area to quell the attack. So according to the men who were on the patrol, uh, when they got to the school, they were told, uh, or when they got to the scene, they were told the armed robbers had taken a particular route. So as they negotiated the a curve, they saw a motorbike take off with speed. So they tried to stop them, thinking that they were the robbers, but they didn't stop. So they pursued them for some time. And the pillion rider, that is the person who was sitting behind the uh, person who was riding, uh, turned. So when uh, he turned, they mistook the turning to be that, and he was holding something in his hand that was that appeared to them as a weapon. So they thought he was turning to shoot them. So they shot at them and then had the two. Unfortunately, uh, later we uh, discovered that they were not the robbers, but indeed they were also running around to see if they could get some assistance for the uh, victims. So that is uh, what's what, what happening. It is a very, it is, it is a very serious matter and uh, an unfortunate one as well. And the uh, command is not happy about it at all. As I speak to you, a delegation has been sent by the command to Mampon to ascertain the situation and also uh, investigate the matter. And if the officers who con uh, who who went on that particular duty uh, are found culpable, then the necessary action will be taken against them. You speak of they being culpable, but you've just told us, per the briefing you had, that these men actually mistook the teacher and his brother for armed robbers. That has been established already. So what are the protocols here in dealing with these officers who did not take the right decision? Yeah, you see, you cannot condemn 
somebody without gi giving him the opportunity to also uh, tell you uh, uh, what happened and the uh, the, 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 the real uh, intent or what uh, what, what he to do. Yes, do Tanko, so am I to yeah. infer from what you're saying now that the accounts you've received as to what happened from the police's point of view is not from the two men who who did the shooting and it's from someone else? Yeah, the account, uh, it is a dear commander uh, who briefed the original command, okay? And uh, the investigation is not also being conducted by the division, that is the Mampon division or the Mampon district. The regional command has sent men to the place to uh, conduct their own investigations. So they need to speak to the men involved for them to confirm what we have received from the division. If that okay, is so if you get the clarity you require in the investigations, what happens to the policemen who did this? Yes, when we get the clarification, then uh, we, we will now decide on the action to take based on what we've been able to gather. And in your in your line of duty, when a policeman mistakenly shoots a man who's You heard Ashanti Regional Police PRO ASP Mohamed Tanko in that interaction with my colleague Francis Alban. We can now speak to human rights lawyer Francis Xavier Sosu and uh, pick his thoughts on this matter. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sosu. As a human rights person, how do you receive this news? Um, good evening uh, to you and a very good evening to your cherished viewers. Uh, I must say that this news is indeed a very, very distasteful news. Uh, it is very unfortunate. And for me, it goes to show uh, how sometimes, you know, unprofessional our police services can be and how sometimes they just go about shooting sporadically uh, without any due care and due regard to uh, the right of, you know, the citizens. If you look at these people who have just lost their life Unfortunately, uh, you, you would realize that uh, there is no justification whatsoever from the Ghana Police Service. And I think this is just happening too much in this country and must be condemned in all uncertain terms. Well, this is not the first time we are hearing of an incident like this. I can, uh, a number of them readily come to mind. There was an incident in Winneba. As of now, it's not been solved. A number of them across the country. How, where do we go from here? We, we keep talking about this. It keeps happening. Francis, what, what, how do we deal with this? Well, I, I think that, you know, it is important uh, for the Ghana Police Service to be, re, you know, reoriented. Uh, when you look at the right to life as guaranteed under Article 13 of the 1992 Constitution, uh, one can see that it is a very, very sacred right. And any time uh, an action or inaction will lead to the loss of a life, uh, then that action must be questioned at all costs, particularly when the death that resulted uh, was not out of a, you know, a lawful uh, exercise of one's you know, power. I would, I would say that you know, the, the discretion that the police uses in shooting people, as we have seen, you know, throughout this year, you know, recently some happened, you know, right at, at the back here, actually, Bochy area, we've had people, many people who have just been shot, suspected to be robbers, and who tend not to be robbers. I believe that the essence of the guns police is wielding is to immobilize people so that you can arrest them. Even if they are robbers, what you intend to do is to make sure that you, 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 you immobilize them so that you can get them arrested so they can give you all the leads uh, as far as your investigations are concerned to keep the menace. It is not about going around and just shooting them, you know, because, you know, you believe you are, you know, more armed and, and, and so on and so forth. I believe that, you know, the Ministry of Interior needs to investigate these occurrences. I believe that the public 
need some explanation as far as these issues are concerned. Uh, most too often, I've seen people also just give up. I would encourage the families of the victims to go to court. If we have three, four, five, six, seven families of victims going to court and all of them, you know, bringing an action for compensation for the loss of their, their relatives and, and all these things are going to be charged on the public purse, it would begin to put pressure on the powers that be to make sure that the, to ensure that the right things are done. Otherwise, we'll talk about it, we'll leave it in the air, and they go about continuing with these indisciplinary measures. Well, there are some who feel that we cannot entirely blame the police because in exercising their discretion in cases like this, in instances of this nature, they cannot always get it right, no? Well, but I think that then they are, they are, they are getting it too wrong. Then they are getting it just too, too wrong. I mean, how many lives have we lost this year as a result of this reckless shooting by police? I mean, under the pretext that they are using their, 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 their lawful discretion. You know, any time you see every life in Ghana matters, every single life, whether a child or an adult, everyone matters. And the right to life, like I said from the beginning, it's a very sacred right. So if the police, in the exercise of their powers, you know, mistakenly takes away the life of a person whose life shouldn't have been taken away, then they should be called upon to pay for that. So if the police is paying for each of these lives they, 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 they take away, you know, uh, uh, as a result of their indiscretion, then they'll be more careful. When they see those lives, they, they will look at them twice before, you know, opening fire on them. I don't think that there should be any justification for this. Police r has to, you know, lift up their game. I think it is just happening too often that people are shot, they die, and we say, well, they were suspected armed robbers. Then it turns out to be that they are not armed robbers. All right. Thank you very much, human rights lawyer Francis Xavier Susu. And that'll be all for today's big story. My name is Kwache Afreniyama.